doing tonight? Y'all doing all right? Man, well, it's so good to see you. Uh, we are going to continue a series that I'm working really through this fall. It's an eight-part series where we're taking a look at eight principles of honor. Before we do that, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for spending uh, the middle part of your week. We're right over hump day. Come on, give it up for yourself. It's a big deal. One of the things I love about this church is the hunger that we have for God's word. You know, the Bible says, uh, Jesus says this, as a matter of fact, every single thing in this earth that we care so much about, right, it will come and it will go, but my words, he says, will last forever. I really believe that what God's doing in and through you, you don't even realize when and, and how you're going to need it in the future. I can't tell you how many times I showed up to something extra. I leaned in to something uh, in God's word and I didn't know what it was about, but God just, it was like seeds planted in my heart. Then later I, I would realize, wow, God, you put that there for a reason. And I know I love saying this, but you never rise to the occasion. You always fall to the level of your that's true, and that's what we're doing right now. We're preparing our hearts for everything God wants to do in and through us. How many of you, by a show of hands, want God to do something big in your life? Come on, you want to mean something. Man, we all want that. I believe honor is a key ingredient. We've been talking about spiritual warfare and all different things uh, that have really been going on in our culture. I think it's so timely that we're talking about honor. They really are parallel. It's very difficult to win the spiritual fight for your life apart from honoring God. Everything rises and falls to your ability to honor. We've been learning all about that. I do want to encourage you, if you've missed any of these messages, we do have them available uh, on, uh, I think, YouTube or the Twitter. I don't know where they are, but you can find them online. You can download them uh, on our app as well uh, by uh, going uh, Vintage Church TX, uh, any of the app stores, you can do that as well. But we really have been building each week uh, a new topic. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, no more, more than lip service is what we're going to talk about tonight, which is going to be really, really fun. Uh, if you want to be challenged and convicted, I think you came to the right place. It's going to be really, really good. Uh, before I jump in to week four of our series here, I want to talk just a little bit about Israel. Uh, as you know, we've been praying for Israel. We've been um, really, I've been connecting with a lot of our partners on the ground. As a matter of fact, we're still planning on taking uh, 40 members over to Israel in February, praying that they can get a handle on uh, on all the things that are happening in their nation. We also this week uh, committed to give $20,000 to the nation of Israel. Yeah, you can clap for that. And uh, I, I really believe, I love the series, and I, the, the message tonight is like, no more lip service, not just lip service. You know, I love that because I think that a lot of times we can pray, but it's really, really special. We can do something practical. We have great partners on the ground. They're literally directly in the need. There's no middle person. We're working directly with four uh, nonprofits there through uh, Robert Stearns and Eagles Wings, an incredible organization. Uh, I do want to invite you. I believe uh, what the Bible says is true. When God says those that bless my people will be blessed and those that curse my people will be cursed, I believe he meant what he said. As a matter of fact, it's interesting. I was talking with our pastors before I received a text. I made that decision uh, for our church to give that money a couple days ago, and we had a pretty big need. We had about $140,000 left in the playground, and I actually got a text while I was in the green room of an organization that's going to cover the entire hundred and forty grand that's left. Yeah, yeah. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit said to me, reminded me of that verse. I will bless those who bless my people, and I will curse those who curse my people. And so I want to encourage you to be praying for the people of Israel. You can give all of our funds. Obviously, that's coming out of just our regular funds that we give. Uh, we don't have a printing press. We don't get to print more money. We only have what we have. And so if you'd like to give uh, towards that donation, I would love to do even more in the coming uh, weeks and months. It's going to be very, very important that we stay. Uh, we, we have some sustained support there. And so if you'd like to give, you can give uh, forward slash give. Uh, you can select our missions and outreach fund, and we'll make sure all of the funds go uh, to our partners in Israel. So we've been in this series, Eight Principles of Honor. You know, as we look around the world, it's clear that it seems like everything is unraveling before our eyes, and much of it is a complete lack of honor. First and foremost, a lack of honor for God, but more than that, just really we've lost honor uh, because we've lost honor for God, we've lost uh, honor for other people. You know, the Bible isn't just a book of history. It's not just about a book about what happened. It's a book about what always happens. We can open it and we think we're reading it, but it's really reading us, our intentions, the issues in our own heart. And so we've been learning in this series that honor isn't just something you're born with. As a matter of fact, any parent in here knows you have to teach your kids honor. They don't just come out like perfectly obeying and doing what you want them 
to do. The same is true as a Christian. When you give your life to Christ, the Bible says you are a new creation. John 3, 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus that you are to be born again, not of flesh and blood, but of spirit. And as a baby, did you know you have to learn how to honor? It's so important. It really is directly connected to every single thing that you will do in your Christian life. To define honor, honor is a discipline. It is high to have high esteem, to be weighty, to fear. Many times in Scripture, when you see the word fear, fear and honor are synonymous in Scripture. Every bit of our relationship with God starts with our fear, or honor of Him. I'm going to give just a little quick recap, and then we're going to jump right into our message. I'm going to try to get you out uh, decently on time, maybe plus or minus uh, 10 minutes or so. We're going to try to get you um, out the door here. I hope to I hope God really speaks to you over the next few moments. But we learned in week one that we are created by God to honor. God created everything in six days. The very last creation was the crowning jewel of his creation. You and me, we are not slime plus time. God created us on purpose for a purpose. Six is the number of man in scripture. But then he wasn't done. He says on the seventh day, he what? Did he need to rest because he was tired? No, he didn't. He establishes honor at the very beginning of creation. He says, listen, I made you for so many incredible things, but you've got to always remember that you are not creator. I am the creator. I give you this Sabbath, or our Jewish brothers and sisters call it the Shabbat, so that you can practice honoring me, so that you can keep me first in your life. You can work and do all the great things that God's called you to do, but on the seventh day, stop and remember me. He establishes us, right? He establishes really our entire week, right? On honor, on honor. You and I were created honor. The reality is, is when we honor, we are most blessed, right? God meets us where we are. When we don't honor, all kinds of sin and death come into our life. We see that in Genesis chapter three. If you'd like to read about that, that was week one. Week two, we talked about no other gods. The very first thing you must establish in your heart is that there is one God in heaven and you are not him. You have got to put him first. A lot of times you pray, God, I want you to bless me. But the reality is, is God blesses what he blesses. He blesses his word. If we can just get underneath what he already blesses by honoring him first, by having no other gods before him, we will be most blessed. We built on that. Practically, we're learning how to do this. Week three, we, we, last week we talked about the next principle, do not copy. One of the first things you've got to do in order to honor God is to not copy this wicked world. We talked about Romans chapter 12, verse two. This is a life verse for me. I, it can be a life verse for you. It's changed my life. There's a template about how God changes us. He says, don't copy. I'm say, don't copy. That's the first requirement to everything that comes after. He says, you've got to establish in your heart that I am in this world, but I am not of it. I am in exile here. I am passing through, right? I refuse to copy the behavior and the cups of this world. I must let God transform me into a new person by replacing the way I think with the way he thinks. Then I can learn how to know God's will for me. And in case I was wondering if I do it God's way, his will is good, pleasing, and perfect. This is so important. Tonight, I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 15, our key passage, 7 through 9. Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. These are people who should have known better. They were the people of the book. There were nearly 700 prophecies about Jesus, but they still missed him when he came, fulfilling them. He looks at them in their self-righteousness, and he says, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. As a result, they worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You know, I've walked with God for nearly 29 years. And the longer I've walked with God, the more I've had to be intentional about honoring him with more than just my words. You know, if you ask the average American on the streets, even today, a vast majority of them would say, I'm a Christian. But what they really mean is Jesus is my homeboy. He was a good teacher. He maybe had some good things that I can learn. Like, you know, but keep that in church, right? He's not my savior. He's not my Lord. 
See, a lot of us, the longer we're in church, it's tempting. We move towards this. There's always a drift unless we're intentional. Honor makes us intentional. Remember, it's a discipline, all right? And we can drift to this place where we say amen in all of the right places, right? But our hearts become far from God because we don't actually do what God says. Jesus says it this way in John 14, 15. If you love me, how many of you love God? Come on. Look what he says. Here's the proof. Here's the proof. You will obey my commandments. This is a principle in scripture. Obedience always comes before sacrifice. You try to sacrifice for God before you determine in your heart to obey him, it will wear you out. You will become self-righteous. You will become religious. You will become all talk and no action. You'll say all the right things, but your life will be full of all of the wrong things. However, when we determine in our heart to obey God in his word, guess what happens? Our sacrifices become a great joy. They become this thing that pushes us forward. The Bible says they become that light, that city on a hill, when all the lights are together, by the way, you are not a city. A city is made up of a bunch of families all together. You're stronger. We're stronger when we're shining our light together. The foundation of it has to be obedient. So tonight we're going we're, we're to talk about an act of obedience that really is a test of honor and a message entitled More Than Lip Service. I'm going to open up with this question and I want you to think about it. Are you blessed? Now in a room like this, everybody comes from different walks of life. The younger you are, you're probably poor. That's just how it works. Right? You have to grow. You have to learn. We all come from different backgrounds. Some of us got a really big leg up and some of us didn't get anything. Some of us maybe came from a wealthy family. Some of us didn't. Some of us might have grown up on that side while the others grew up on this side. However, we can all answer this question, are we blessed? I want you to keep this in mind before you answer. According to a recent United Nations survey, a little less than half of the people alive today, that's around 3 billion people live on $2 a day or less. 1.2 billion people live on less than a dollar a day. 1 billion people can't read or write, and 1 billion people don't have safe drinking water. In light of all that, are you blessed? Okay, so we're going to agree we're all blessed by God. Well, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that God's blessed us. We don't deserve it. Yet the bad news is that research shows that the more people earn, the less they give. This is just a fact, as that famous Duck Dynasty grandfather would say, that's a fat jack. That's just how it is. Now, wouldn't you think, and we say this, because we say this to ourselves all the time, wouldn't you think that the more blessed you are, the more generous, generous you would be? And yet, as counterintuitive, as much of a paradox as it is, that's simply not true. It's also not biblical. It's not biblical. Studies show that as income increases, increases the percentage of what people give decreases. To give you some recent statistics in the United States, a person with an average income gives about 3.1% of what they earn annually away to churches and charities. Interestingly, those who make less than average, those whose annual income is below the poverty line, they don't give 3.1%, they give 5.2%. This is interesting. Those that are extremely blessed, those who earn over $200,000 per year, guess what their average giving is? 3.1%, 5.2%, no, it's actually 0.7%. It's less than 1%. We see here that generosity is not attached to how much you have. Quite simply, it's attached to what you love the most. Here's the big question for today as we talk about more than lip service. Will we love and trust money or will we love and honor God? This is a big one. It's a big principle in the kingdom. The Bible says that where our heart is, or where our treasure is rather, that is where our heart will be. And God constantly wants to know because it's a constant issue that we face as believers. Jesus says in Luke 16, 10, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful, in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches 
of God. You know, when we talk about unrighteous mammon, a lot of people say the root of all evil is money. That's not true. It's the love of money, and it's tied to this unrighteous mammon we're going to learn about tonight. You see, here's what God knows. God knows that for most of us, money and possessions will be the number one competitor for our hearts. Money and possessions. Jesus talked more about money and how you and I relate to material wealth than he talked about faith, hope, and love combined. A lot of people go into a church and they'll say things like, man, it just seems like we're always talking about money or the church just wants my money. Nothing could be further from the truth. A healthy church just wants you to walk in what God's, what God's blessing is for you. And the truth is you cannot serve two masters. Money is a counterfeit God. That's where this word mammon comes from. I'm gonna prove it to you. Money promises you things that only God can give you. Money promises security. It says if you have more, you'll be secure and you'll be protected. Money says that you can have more freedom. If you have more, you'll have unlimited options. Money promises power, suggesting that if you have enough, you can be strong and influential. Money promises significance. If you have more, you will be esteemed and you will be important. The truth is all of us, if we're being honest, we think about a loved one or we think about somebody who seemed to have had everything in the world but could stop a terminal illness. We know that in that moment, they would have traded all of that money for just another day, for just another week. Matthew 6.24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or else you will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Look what he says. You cannot serve God and mammon. I believe this with all of my heart. This is why I teach this regularly. Of all the things I've ever done in my life that have positioned me and my wife for God's blessing, it has been the biblical practice of tithing. It is the number one thing that has brought us blessing. And we have not always been pastors. We have been newlyweds with no money. We have been faced with a situation where we have to decide, do we want to pay our bill or to pay our tithes. There's a lot of people who would say, I just can't afford it, pastor. What I've learned following God is there's never been a time that if I couldn't afford it, I shouldn't have done it because those are the moments that it becomes the most important. And this word mammon is really important because I believe God wants his people blessed. You know, a lot of pastors, you know, they teach this topic wrong. There's one of two extremes, right? There's one that says, you know, uh, one that says that everybody should be poor all the time. Uh, matter of fact, priests in the Catholic Church, they take a vow of poverty. Uh, nothing could be more unbiblical. There's nothing in the Bible that says that you should do that. Um, the truth is, it's very difficult to be a blessing to people. How in the world could we send anything to our brothers and sisters in Israel if we didn't have anything? So nothing could be further from the truth. But there's also people who, who want to treat God like he's some type of like genie in a bottle. You know, you rub him the right way. You say the right words in the right way. You do the right things. You, you pray for the right prayer cloth that the man of God touched on his head. You know, you can have all the riches of heaven. And the truth is, I, I don't believe that there's anything biblical that, it, it, listen, here, I had a pastor say it this way. If the theology surrounding money works in the United States, which is prosperous, but, won't, but doesn't work in sub-Saharan Africa, which isn't, then it's not from God. The truth is what I'm gonna teach you is something that you can actually do right where you are no matter what. What is this word mammon? Mammon is the Aramaic word for money and wealth when it's personified and opposed to God. Mammon is this Aramaic word for money and wealth when it is personified into a God that occupies number one in your life. And this can look one of two ways. It can look like the guy who puts all of his hope or the family who puts all of his hope in his money, right? <laughs> he's, he's, he's dollar poor but penny rich. Come on, you know what I'm saying? Like it's like money, money, everything's money, everything's money. I gotta, I gotta cheat everyone. I gotta get the best deal all the time. It's like the most important thing. But it's also, I've seen it a lot in people that have little. They look with envy and with spite and with malice towards people who have and they think that if they had had it better, right, they think they would use it better. You see, it doesn't matter where you find yourself today. Maybe you have a lot of money or a little money. Mammon is still a very, very big thing, especially in our culture. 
the number one test of honor. Number one is the biblical practice of tithing. I'm going to talk about that for just a few moments. Uh, Leviticus 27.30, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. The Hebrew word for tithe is the word maser. It literally means a tenth or ten percent. Here's what the Bible teaches from cover to cover before the law of Moses and after the resurrection of Christ. God requires the tithe of everything, of every increase. He calls for a tithe off of what I earn, whatever my salary is. If I sell my house for a profit, a tithe, I tithe off that increase. If I get a bonus for my job, I tithe off that increase. If I get a tax return, I tithe off the increase. The Bible actually says that tithing is not giving because it's something that we bring, we don't give. You see, it comes before generosity because if we can't obey God, right, we can't actually cultivate in our hearts a biblical generosity. You might see, oh, pastor, you're way out there. Where in the world does the Bible say something like that? It's in the very last book of the Bible. God says it very directly in Malachi 3, verses 8 through 9. He asked this rhetorical question, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? Look what he says, in tithes and offerings. He goes on to say in verse 9, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, a lot of pastors misteach this passage. It's this idea that God curses us. God doesn't curse you. Did you know everything on planet Earth after the fall of man is cursed? What God's saying is when you don't honor me in the tithe, your stuff remains under the curse. And you guys know the curse, right? You know the devourer? You know how you get to the end of the month, right? And it's, you know how everybody just wants a piece? Come on. Seems like money's leaking everywhere. That's what that is. This, this world system is under a curse. I'm going to give you some context to Malachi, and then I'm going to talk to you about some, some fundamentals here. For years, the context of Malachi, for years, God had blessed his people. They were faithful to return to him, their first and their best. In fact, in biblical times, that was with sheep. They would bring their first and their best lamb as a sacrifice to God. There, were, uh, there was birds and different things that could be substituted. That was primarily what they would bring. Some of them started saying, now hang on a second, I have so much stuff now, I can't possibly give a tenth out of all of this. I mean, that's just too much, so I'm going to lower the standard. Instead of giving him the first and the best of their livestock, they rationalized their disobedience because the best will actually increase the genetics of my flock and they will get better over time. So instead of giving God the first and the best, I'm going to give him the little gimpy one with the lazy eye. I'm going to start taking out and minimizing what I give God. And they began to do this thinking God wouldn't notice. In, in essence, they were serving leftovers to God. And God basically said, all right, if you don't want to remember me, I'll just let you do it without me. And all of a sudden, their crops are not doing well. The economy tanks. And he says, if you want to ignore me, let's see how well it goes for you. You see, many times as we're walking with God, we begin to discover truths of his word. God begins to bless us. And like children who need to learn, many times, right, we start to love the gifts of God more than God. And as a result, we start to offer lip service to God instead of obedience to God. This is really what the biblical practice of tithing is all about. God is a father. I know a little something about that I remember, and I've told this story several times in our church. I remember when Adeline, our first daughter, our eldest daughter, was four years old. We used to love to go to Chick-fil-A. I don't know what they put in that chicken. I'm not sure. I guarantee you somebody's tithing in that company. I don't know what it is, but it's blessed. And we love going, and she's little, and, you know, my wife never eats all of her fries. And so, you know, I never actually ordered the fries. Why? Because I knew that I would be able to have hers. And one day we go to Chick-fil-A and I order her fries. I don't order any. And as we sit down, I'm eating my sandwich. I reach out to get one of her fries and she slaps my hand. And she says, no, Papa, that's my fry. This happens three times. Three is the number of completion. And let me just tell you, by three times, I was finished. So I see a teaching moment 
for my child. I looked her square in the face and I said, you need to understand this young lady. Your father provided the fries for you. I just want a few, just 10% back to me. Return unto me the tithe of the fries. I went on to say, in your world, I'm the Lord of the fries. The way I see it is, I could make sure until you're 18, you never get a fry again. Or I could open up the windows of Chick-fil-A and pour out on you so many fries you could not contain it. In your world, I am the Lord of the fries. Give back unto me a tenth of your fries. How many of you parents understand? God is a parent. The tithe is a blessing. It is a check on whether or not we're honoring God. So what I want to do for the next few moments is I'm going to give you three blessings of the tithe. Now, I want to make very clear, okay, I don't, I only care that you tithe in as much, that, as much as it blesses you. A lot of times people teach the tithe from purely a church-centered perspective. The reality is God will take care of this church with or without you. The truth is he invites you in to be a part of his blessing as your life is built up in it. Here's what I'll say. The tithe is not really about God's house primarily. The tithe is about your house. And when you understand that, you start seeing things from a different perspective. Three blessings of the tithe. First, the tithe provides for God's work through his church. This is interesting because all of the money you give actually comes right back to you in the form of healthy churches. Look what Malachi says in Malachi 3.10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. The storehouse has always been the Old Testament picture of the New Testament church. Bring the whole tithe into the house of God that there may be food in my house. This is interesting about God. God takes the things we honor him with and he chooses to that proportion to build up his people and his kingdom on earth. He could have done it any other way. And sometimes, I'll be honest with you as a pastor, I get a little entitled sometimes. And I think to myself, if only God just gave the church a golden goose, I would take care of that goose a lot better than I've taken care of my chickens. Come on. And if only every time we had a need, he would just lay another egg. But that's not how God's done it. Because God is a dad. God wants us to grow up and to mature into all that he's called us to be. And if we can't get this, it's going to be very difficult for us to get anything else. Tithing makes an impact not only in your life, but also in other people's lives as well. Next, the tithe increases our faith in God. Here's what it does. Tithing teaches us that 90% with the blessing of God goes further than 100% without his blessing. Let me say it again. Tithing makes an impact not only in your life, but in other people's lives. Tithing teaches us that 90% with the blessing of God goes further than 100% without his blessing. Now, there's three kinds of people in here. The first people are the people who tithe. And you know what I'm saying is absolutely true. Then there's people, I don't know about that. I'm going to keep teaching. Then there's people who have closed their heart to the topic altogether. And I would suspect mammon has a lot to do with that. Let me share an interesting story with you. I was uh, talking with a pastor friend of mine years ago, and he was telling me a story about a man that had grown up in his church. He had grown up in his church, and he had established a very, very successful business. He had been in the church nearly 20 years. He started out uh, as, a, as an er somebody in the early 20s. He started learning God's word. Matter of fact, he learned this message, and it changed his life the message on principle of the first or returning the tithe. And so this young man, when he had very, very little, he began to tithe. And as a result, God began to bless him. And by the way, blessing didn't just come to this man's life through windfalls of cash. God began to give him ideas. God began to position him in the right place. God began to bless his family. God began to bless his life. He started a business and he still tithed and he was tithing. And God began to expand that business. And he became a major, major giver in this church. Until one day, he sees his pastor in the commons. He pulls his pastor aside and he says, you know what, pastor, listen. I remember, man, tithing's changed my life. I remember when I first started giving the tithe, man, God came through in so many miraculous ways and God's established this business. And man, I'll, I'll be honest, I, we're, gonna, we're gonna clear a million dollars this year in profit. And I gotta be honest, pastor, a million dollars, a hundred thousand dollars in tithe, man, Will you pray for me? That's a really hard check for me to write. And that pastor said, you know what, sir, I'll absolutely pray for you. They bowed his head. They bowed each other's head and they started praying. The pastor said, God, I pray and I thank you for all the blessing that you've given this man by, obe by obeying you. 
And I pray right now, Father, that you, redu- you would reduce his income back to the level with which he can trust you with it. As he starts praying, the guy goes, no, don't pray that. And he says, I'm going to pray it every single day. Because it's not about the number. It's about the posture of your heart. This is so important. Malachi 3.10, and try me in this, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that you will not have room enough to receive it. When you look at this, we immediately think like, you know, the one-armed bandit, you know, the sweepstakes, you know, publisher's clearing house, if that's still a thing. We think God's just going to give us it all at once. And by the way, if he did that, you'd waste it. Okay, you would. You wouldn't be ready for it. Notice what he says here. If I will not open for you windows of heaven. Window is a channel into your life. You know what happens when you honor God with the tithe? He opens up windows of blessing or channels into your life. Multiple channels. He says, windows of blessing for you. God says, put me to the test. Here's the question, why 10%? Well, first of all, that's because that's what God said. That's what God chose. He could have chosen any number, but he chose 10. I think it's interesting in the Bible. 10 in the Bible is often a picture of the number of testing. I've talked about this a lot. God gave us how many commandments? 10. When God tested Pharaoh's heart in the Old Testament, how many plagues did he send to test him? 10. In the New Testament, how many lepers were healed before one came back to give gratitude? 10. 10 is often the number of testing. But the tithe is under the law. We're not under the law anymore, says the one controlled by mammon. The law, the tithe actually predated the law. In Genesis 4, Abraham tithed to Melchizedek over 400 years before the law of Moses was given. Cain and Abel brought an offering to the Lord. Actually, the Bible says Abel brought what God required. Cain brought what he wanted when he felt like it. God accepted one and didn't accept the other. If you look in the book of Matthew 23, Jesus unquestionably affirms the tithe. He says, woe to you when speaking to the religious scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. You see, they were tithing out of a spirit to be seen by others. And it wasn't having its effect because it wasn't in honor to God. This is why we don't pull tithing records and we don't require that you give all the time. And we're not beating down your door because honor is never taken by God. It's always freely given always freely given. And that's why it's important that you don't fall into legalism. The tithing teaches us, the tithe teaches us to honor God. Write that down. The tithe teaches us to honor God, to put him first. I love this passage in Deuteronomy 14, 23. It says this about the tithe. Doing this will teach you always to fear the Lord your God. Doing this will teach you to always fear or honor God. It's amazing. Every first and 15th, every month, and for some of you business leaders, every year, whenever it is, whenever that increase comes in, guess what the opportunity is? It's another test. It's another test of your heart. It's another test to put obedience where your mouth is and to actually walk out your faith practically. You may be saying, Pastor Stephen, when the Bible says the tithe is a tenth. I'm not sure I can do that. I mean, I would have to rearrange everything. Is that what you're asking me to do? No, that's what the Bible's commanding you to do. As a believer, don't look at me in that tone of voice. We can still be friends after this. I didn't say it. The Bible says it. And this is really important anytime you hear a tough teaching. Anytime you hear a tough teaching, I've learned this. There's a difference between condemnation and shame and the conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit. Here's the difference. For those of you who are born again, right? You are no longer under condemnation, okay? But there will be times when you learn something in God's word and something in you does this, okay? Many pastors are really scared at allowing God's people to do this. But if you don't, if we don't allow this, you'll never grow. This is what's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And here's what the conviction of the Holy Spirit does. It gives you an indication that how you think is not in line with how God thinks. And here's what I'll tell you about God. No matter how much you wish it or hope it or sing it or believe it, God will never violate his word, ever. He will never rearrange the universe to orbit you. When you feel this inside, it's a good indication 
to say, God, God, I'm going to stop squeezing, hanging on, and I'm going to open up my hand. You see, here's what happens. When we hang on to the things in this world, we allow the spirit of mammon to control our life, right? The Bible says it this way. The person who holds on to his life, it will slip between their fingers. They'll lose it. But the one who gives up their life for me will gain it again. You know what's amazing as I've walked living open-handed? And anybody who knows me, I practice what I preach. I'm in the top five givers in this church. I'm frustrated, actually, because I used to be one for years. But many people in here have usurped me. I'm working on getting back to number one. The Bible says of all the things you're going to compete about, compete in doing good. Compete in generosity. You know what I've learned when I've lived open-handed? I've learned that God always provides seed to the sower. And that if when he puts something in my hand, if I will always keep it surrendered to him and be open to where he wants me to put it, he always makes sure that I have enough. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. It requires faith to give first. And I want to close and I want you to think about this for a moment. One of the things I love about God is he never just tells us to do something that he hasn't already done. Do you realize that God has already gone first? God has already stepped forward and given you and I everything we need in this life through the person of Christ. Romans 5, 8, look what God did. He demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In response, we've got to learn to live God's way. We've learned several principles so far. Starting In the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about how those principles lay out in our relationships, in our relationships with our parents and our family, in our relationships with one another and the church, in our relationships with government and different authority in our lives. Okay, but first and foremost, we've got to make sure that God is first. God commands us to tithe. I would say it this way. A Christian that doesn't tithe doesn't honor God. I know, I know it's hard. It's okay. I'm going to be your friend no matter what. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. I didn't say it. I'm going to love you. I'm going to serve you. But I'm never going to not tell you the truth. I would have to hate you to hold back one of the very foundational things that have made everything you're being a part of a success. We put God first here. And when you put God first in your own life, he meets you where you are. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you so much for the power of your word. I thank you, God, that you never lead us to do anything, never lead us to do anything that diminishes us, that steals from us, that hurts us. Father, you said that's the devil. That's not you. But Jesus, you did say that you came to bring life, and not just eternal life, but the best life today. Father, I pray for those believers in here. First, I pray, Father, for those who honor you with the tithe. I pray you would continue to bless them. Why? To be a blessing to others. I thank you, Father, that you would continue to meet every single need that they have and to give them more than enough so that they can meet the needs of other people as you lead. Father, I also pray for those who are really struggling with this message. I pray, God, that they would humble themselves. They would look into your word for themselves. That, Father, they would allow the perfect word to wash over their heart and their life. And that, Lord, they would adjust their life to your word. I thank you, Father, for everything you do in our life. I also pray, Father, for those who their next step isn't to tithe, but it's to surrender their life to Christ. As heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father, I pray that if there's anybody in here that doesn't know you, I pray that they would not leave this place the way that they came in. As heads are bowed, eyes are closed, we're almost done. In an attitude of prayer, maybe you're in here today and you're far from God. You know if you're far from God, I don't have to point a finger at you or accuse you. Your own conscience does that. By the way, the Bible calls that the conviction of the Holy Spirit as well. And I want to encourage you, as a person who was created by God on purpose for a purpose, you can never be all that God's created you to be apart from a relationship with Him. You can't get to Him apart from Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins, past, present, and future, who rose from the dead, defeating death, so that you too could rise 
not just in eternal life, but in every area of your life. And as heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Maybe at some point you followed him, but you're not following him today. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ and you need to humble yourself and do that today. In a moment, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to single you out. I'm not going to call you up. I'm not going to do any of that. But right where you're seated, I do want to pray for you before we leave. If there's anybody in here you haven't followed Christ, maybe you started, but you've stopped, and you'd like to get right today, would you just let me know if you want my prayer with an uplifted hand? Is there anybody in here like that? Say, Pastor, pray for me. Thank you. You put your hand up. Go back there. I see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're never the only one. That's always the lie the devil tells us. Is there anyone else? Say, Pastor, that's me. Pray for me. Thank you. I see you. In a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's a prayer from Scripture, from Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. As a matter of fact, everybody surrounding you is also going to pray with you so as to encourage your faith. And I want you to pray this prayer just loud enough where you can hear your own voice. I believe God's going to meet you. I believe he's going to change you. We also have some next steps that we want to give you so that you can grow up and into all that God's created you to do. Church, we believe in what they're doing. Let's pray this prayer all together. Let's pray, Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth, for living a perfect life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I believe that you are good and I believe you're God. I believe on the third day after you were killed on the cross, I believe you rose from the dead. I believe you defeated death once and for all to give me life once and for all. And so today of my own free will, I choose to make you my Lord, my Savior, and my King. Lead me and guide me. Show me what's next. It's in your name that I pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Come on, church. Let's put our hands together for everybody who did that.